So I'm going to talk to you today about simple SQL change management. But first I want to start out with a brief review of what I at least think is wrong with the typical migrations models that we're used to seeing. Uh, one is that often they're, imp they're, imp they're implemented with an incomplete mini language, which uh, my experience with this stuff has primarily been with Rails migrations. And I found that uh, pretty much I just used the, the SQL interface and ignored all the mini language stuff, which was a very, very small sub subset of SQL. But that's what's encouraged in those sorts of things. Um, another issue I had with Rails migrations in particular was there was no integration with logical replica replication. We got Sloney all set up on our system before I realized that we couldn't actually deploy changes to Sloney via migrations because they're completely incompatible being Ruby scripts. Um, another issue that I'm sure you've all had headaches with is that numbered scripts are hard to track. So you ha either have to have some sort of system of allocating numbers to developers or using uh, epoch timestamps which are meaningless and long and ugly or some sort of thing. At, at my, uh, I work at a company called Iovation and for our existing deployment stuff for Oracle we have a wiki page where developers have to log in and register a number on the wiki page saying, this is my number, before they can write a deployment script. Another issue is that there's no VCS awareness in, in these systems. They are completely independent of VCS and they don't necessarily know it's there. So what about SQL migrations? These fix the issues with mini language because now we can just use the native scripting language of the database we're targeting. And because we're doing that, uh, the logical replication issue is less of an issue because again, we could have for Postgres pure SQL scripts to do the deployments. But another issue uh, that's also true of the numbered migrations uh, is that managing stored procedures is a pain in the ass with deployment systems. For example, imagine that we had a stored procedure and we needed to make a change to it, an existing stored procedure, we needed to make a relatively simple add three lines of code to a procedure, right? Here's the diff. Not too big a deal. This is from some really old code I had years ago. But you can't make a change in line in a migration script. What you have to do instead is paste the entire function from the original script they used to create the function into a new one and edit the new file to make your changes. So now you have a, com a complete copy to make a three-line change. Then you copy the original one again to the down version of the, the migration script here so that it will recreate it as it was in case you have to revert, right? So now we have three copies of what is essentially the same function. And we've lost the advantage of, the, of using the source code system to track those changes. And I'll show you some more about that later. But I have believed for a very long time that this really sucks. Uh, what about Liquibase? Well, I haven't looked at it too much except to this. <laughs> And that was enough. I'm a, a database practitioner. I am perfectly happy and comfortable writing in this really great um, uh, domain-specific language called SQL. Not so enamored of writing SQL as XML. Uh, Depends, who is a very well-known Postgres hacker, has his own versioning system, which I have been using actually at our job. Um, it's pretty nice. You can get it on GitHub. And basically what it is is it's just a, a couple of stored procedures and a couple of bash scripts. And one of the nice things about it is it does dependency resolution. So you can say this patch requires these other patches or conflicts with these other patches. And when you do a deployment, uh, because the uh, deployments are done by first calling stored procedures, those procedures can check those dependencies and throw an, an exception if they are not met, which is pretty nice. Um, of course, it has very, very tight Postgres uh, integration, it being solely stored procedures written in the database and storing stuff in a magic schema. 
Again, there's no VCS integration, no tools other than the bash script and the quick Perl script I wrote at work to do stuff, and <laughs> which parses the SQL at the beginning of every file. Um, and managing procedures is still a pain in the ass because not only do I have to copy the file, but because there is the, uh, the first line of the deployment scripts is a call to register a patch, I have to be very particular about that. So I can't include, I can't use like the backslash I to include one script and another script because that function will create problems. So we still have to create three copies of it. So I, I've struggled with this on and off for, for several years. And, and uh, earlier this year, I had an epiphany about how I thought it might be useful to change the way we do this stuff. And uh, I've been blogging about it and thinking a lot about it and um, working on the implementation now which of something I call Sketch. So you might be wondering, what? So, <laughs> Quickly, how I came up with the name is I was thinking about SQL change management. And what could I get out of that? So I started with just calling it sketch like this. I thought, well, it might be nice to have something in the middle. What if we stuck a VCS in there? I'll just dump the G and push it all together. That's why it's called sketch. There is no U <laughs> in this word. It's not squitch. So let me talk a bit about the philosophy of where I'm coming from and kind of the, the goals I have for the project. I wanted to have no opinions about what database system you were using. And this means primarily that you do the deployment scripts in the native uh, SQL scripting interface for your platform. So for Postgres, you'd write, you'll write PSQL scripts. For SQLite, you'll write SQLite 3 scripts, etc. I wanted to have VCS integration because VCS is pretty good at taking care of your history. You can use the history tracking of the VCS to help you track the deployment order of your uh, changes. Uh, I wanted to steal dependency resolution, at least in a minor way, from Depez's stuff so that you could declare basic uh, requirements and conflicts. And I didn't want to have any fucking numbering. <laughs> But I also wanted, even though it's going to have integration with version control systems like Git, I also wanted to have a way for people to be able to bundle things into distributions so that you don't have to have a VCS on target systems to use it. You have to have Git on the target system, but I wanted to be able to bundle it up so uh, Skitch could just read. You, know, you don't have to have Git. You have to have Skitch. So that Skitch could read um, the plan and do the distribution. And so you could bundle things up in an RPM or a tarball or whatever you want. Um, particularly with reference to the procedure stuff, I wanted reduced duplication because that's, a, I guess, a pet peeve of mine. But I also wanted to have it to have built-in configuration. Um, I modeled this uh, on Git's interface so that you can tell it what uh, database you're deploying to, what the name of your database is, uh, all sorts of other stuff that you can put in there to help ease the management of your changes. It also includes deployment planning. So this is a file that lists out what should be deployed where and when. It also has the concept of tagging, which I stole right out of version control systems. Uh, so a bit of terminology, a step is basically a single patch or a single change script that is applied to your system. And there are actually three scripts that correspond to a step. There's one for the deployment, one for the reversion, and one for testing so that you can run a test after you do the deployment. The next step is a tag. A tag is a name list of steps that represents a release point, basically in the application you're developing. Uh, the plan is the list of tags and their corresponding steps to go from, to migrate up and migrate down uh, in your database. Deployment, of course, is making the changes and deploying them to your database. And revert is removing those changes from your database. 
So before I go any further, a few caveats. Uh, Sketch is under heavy development right now. I released version, a, t a testing release today, B0.3. This is alpha, alpha, alpha code. Uh, but for people can start uh, playing on. But functionality is rapidly evolving. This talk is based on a tutorial I wrote up, which also functions as a functional specification for the project. And of course, things are changing as, as we're doing development and figuring things out. So there are some good ideas here that will be in the core of whatever becomes Sketch 1.0. But don't expect everything you see today to be in that version because it will change and people will tell me I'm being stupid in various ways and we'll make it better. There's still some gaps to be filled in. There are some places where I've just did some arm waving and said, then magic happens. Um, those will get filled in. And I'm still thinking about how to do the VCS integration, but a, a bit more on that later. So, but let's start with some of the original uh, ideas here. So here's how it works. Um, Let's say we wanted to create a project, so I'll call it Flipper. It's the anti-social network. <laughs> I'm just going to create a Git repository. And then I'm going to run Sketch init. So I'm initializing this project for, for Sketch. And what this is doing is it's writing uh, di directories that will be used for the deployment, reversion, and testing scripts. And then it's writing a configuration file. The configuration file will help, obviously, with, at least I hope it's obvious, with uh, deployment stuff. So let's take a quick look at it. The default one is just this. So there's a core setting, and the engine I'm using is PG, and that's because I used the dash dash engine uh, option when I initiated. So now with this here in this directory, as long as I'm running Sketch from within this directory, it will always assume the PG engine when it's doing deployments and reversions and whatnot. There are a bunch of other settings you can see here for uh, plan files and various locations of things and the extension to use on the files, the scripts that you write. And then there's database engine specific settings you can set here as well. So I modeled the configuration of Sketch on Git's configuration stuff. So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, there are three levels of configuration. There's configuration locally in the directory you're currently in. That's in the .git config file. Then there's one for uh, your, your user information, which git calls global. And that's in your home directory. It's called .git config, I think. And then there's one that's system-wide that's called slash etsy slash git config. And so whatever, when you run git, it finds whatever configurations are in your current directory, and it falls back on stuff in your user directory, and it falls back on stuff in your system directory. So this is useful to set things system-wide or for all of your personal projects as a user, and then have stuff specific to individual projects in those directories. So one of the things I want to do is uh, set up Sketch so that it knows where my uh, PostScript PSQL client is at all the times. So I use the config command, and I tell it that I want to make a change to the user configuration. And I'm just setting the PG client to the location for PSQL. And if we take a look at that file, which is in .sketch slash sketch.config conf in your home directory, you can see the configuration files there. And there are all kinds of changes that you can make to the configuration stuff. There are, there are quite a few, a lot more configuration settings than are currently used <laughs> in the system. But this is nice because now whenever I'm doing development on this particular system, it always knows where to find PSQL. So I'm going to go ahead and commit the configuration file in those empty directories. And now it's time to make our first deployment script. So the command to do that is called add step. And what it does is it writes out three scripts for use uh, as your step. The first one is the deploy script. The second one is the revert script, and the third one is the test script. Let's take a look. So this is what the default deploy script looks like. This is based on a very simple templating language, and you can change the templates if you want in your um, personal uh, .skitch directory, in your home directory. Um, 
But basically, it just sets up a placeholder and suggests you use transactions. So all I'm doing is I'm changing it to create a role that is going to be used by my application. And then I'm going to change the revert script here to just simply drop that role. Pretty straightforward. This is going to be familiar to anybody who's done migrations kind of stuff, right? So let's give it a, a, a try. I'm going to create a test database. And then I'm going to run sketch deploy. And I tell it to use this database. And I'm also using the untracked option here. And this means find those steps that have been created but are not yet tracked by the VCS. And when it does that, it deploys to a special tag named head plus, meaning stu stuff in addition to what's known for the VCS. But you can see here, it has, in fact, deployed the app user step. And if we take a look at the database, you can see that the role was successfully created. So um, the status command shows you the current status of the database you ask it about. I haven't written it yet. So this thing here means this is planned, but not implemented yet. But the idea here is it'll show you what the current tag is and what the last step deployed was and the date it was deployed. Uh, probably should say by whom, too, now that I think about it. And it will also say, you are fully up to date. Right, I said that. So the metadata is stored in the database. So for Postgres, there'll be a special schema called Sketch, although you can change the name of the schema. And it tracks the metadata there. There are several tables. We can also revert. And I simply tell it to, uh, re if you tell it to revert with no, without telling it what to revert to, it'll revert everything. I have only the one tag. So it's reverting all changes and removing that step. And sure enough, if we look, the role is now gone. I hope this is not shocking to anyone. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put a tag where you have like dollar sign tag <laughs> this is why somebody suggested in an in a, um, issue they put in Git, why not make it um, so that the deploy also does reverts? You just tell it what to revert to. I said, because I, I want that to be something really separate. In fact, probably for revert, if you don't specify anything, it should say, are you sure? One thing uh, we've done in our command line client is anytime you do something that can't be undone or constructed, <laughs> you type in the name of the like, app or database or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there are various ways to try to protect people from shooting themselves in the foot. I'm pretty good at that, so I'll probably end up putting them in. Shooting myself in the foot, I mean. Um, so now if we run uh, the status command, it's going to show that nothing is deployed. But it'll also show what has, hasn't been deployed and what you can do. Let's see, do I highlight that? Yeah. So it says, hey, the head tag could be deployed with its app user step. Uh, Owen. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Now I'm going too far. So then uh, it's, it tells you what you can run to actually deploy it. So this is a new it's the same as having a new database, basically. Um, the log command will read the history. So recall that we've reverted the change here. And yet, if I run sketch log, it will show me two records here. One, the most recent one, this step was reverted uh, by David. And this uh, step was deployed by David. So even though we've removed stuff, we keep a complete history. So you can really, hopefully, have a better idea of whom to blame when things go wrong. Magic. <laughs> you see this? I uh... <laughs> <laughs> Means I can't type. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go ahead and commit that change. So now we have our first change checked in. And we could again say deploy. And this time it will deploy using the uh, git 
SHA-1 as the tag name. This would be a potential default. Uh, this part isn't actually, I haven't done the VCS integration yet, so hence the, the bang. But the idea then is that we would have this named by the VCS, which is keeping track of our tags for us. And if we run the update, or excuse me, the status command again, it will show us now this is the tag and this is the user and hopefully the correct timestamp. Now, I, I was getting a little tired continually typing in dash dash db dash name in the name of the database because I'm doing development, I'm doing rapid iterative stuff. And so I just wanted to always use the flipper test database. So I'm calling the skitch config command and I'm telling it the, the core uh, Postgres database name for this project is called Flipper Test. The other nice thing about that is that then if somebody does this without specifying a database in production or something, it won't break production. They will have to specifically type in the name of that database because the configuration file names the test database. But now, of course, I don't have to type dash dash data db dash name, but I still get the, the status information. So let's, uh, let's add dependencies. I'm going to add a step now, and I'm going to say that this new step, which I am calling users, requires the app user step that I've already created. And so when it writes out the deploy script, it notes that this is required. And what that means, if we take a look at the deploy script, is that there is now a line with this little mini language, if you will, that says, this step requires this other step. The values here can be a common delimited list, or you can have multiple lines for your requires. Now, the template puts in multiple lines for you. So let's go ahead and create our users table. That's good. And then I'll, I'll edit the revert script that, to simply drop the users table. So let's deploy that. Again, I'm doing untrack because I have not checked these into the Git repository. And so it's deploying head plus again with the users tag. And if I go ahead and I look at the database, there's our users table. And the status shows that's where we left it off. Again, tracked by the, by the database. And we can revert to head, head being the last known uh, commit in the version control system. And so it's going to revert to untracked stuff, which means I can now check it in. And then I can deploy it, and it'll get the new SHA-1. The little beetle means that this is buggy. So you've been warned. So. Again, I'm running the status, and this time I'm using the show tags uh, option. So in addition to showing me what the most recent tag is and the most recent step, it's showing a list of all the tags that have been deployed, when and by whom. So the show command, there's quite a bit. Of it, it, there are a couple of different things you can get it to show you for additional information. So you can get more information about the status of your database relative to your plan. Now, it's time to create some stored procedures. We have the users table, and I want to have a function to insert new users into it. This, of course, is going to require the users step and the app users step. The app users, because I'm going to grant to it. So again, when I add the step, it notes that they have been required. I'm going to add a second one called change pass. And this is going to be a stored procedure I'm going to write to change the user's password. Again, same dependencies. Do you have to specify dependencies? You don't. And de um, so tags are always run in order. So if you have a dependency on something in an earlier tag, you don't have to specify it because it's going to be installed. Uh, within a tag, if you have a number of steps, they could be applied theoretically in any order. Mm -hmm. And so you do want to declare the dependencies within a tag. Uh, I probably would make a habit of always declaring dependencies as much as I can, just for documentation purposes, if nothing else, and to sanity check myself. 
the dependencies are also tracked in the database. So it, it knows what needs what. So uh, here, again, it's written out the two requires. Again, this could be a common delimited list. I just made it um, two lines. So here's my function. All I'm doing is I'm inserting into the user's table a nickname and uh, MD5 hash of the password. And I'm granting on insert user to Flipper. So because I'm using the Flipper user, I have to require the app user. And because I'm using, uh, I'm inserting into the users table, I need to do users. Now, requiring users, users requires app users, so it's implicit. But I, again, I, I will probably make a habit of trying to be explicit. And I will likely forget sometimes. And the change path script, uh, you know, it's relatively similar. Again, it has the prerequisites here. Uh, and then I'll just write my, my function. change the password. So let's go ahead and deploy these. Again, I'm calling deploy with untracked. And it, it is deploying the two changes that are part of this tag, which is currently called head plus. And if I take a look at the database, you can see that those tags, or excuse me, those steps have been, or the functions in those steps have been deployed. Yay. So again, I'm going to commit it. Uh, it would follow the same pattern. I revert to head, I commit the changes, uh, then I would deploy them into my little development database. So with this, it's time to think about uh, a QA release. So I'm going to tag this in Git. I gave it the tag, a dev1 tag. And I'm going to create a new Flipper dev database and test deploy it to there. So it first deploys the, that first SHA-1 tag with its step, then the second SHA-1 tag with its step, and then the third SHA-1 tag with its two steps. And note that this is also the place where it has the tag that I have inserted into Git. And as a result, if we look at the state once it's been deployed, or the status, I should say, and ask it to show us tags, it shows a list of all the tags. And these, these two are basically at the same point, two names for the same point. Uh, and they're also listed here. So we come to distribution bundling. It's time to package this thing up, because one thing I know about operations is they don't want to deploy via Git in our environment. They want RPMs for everything, which makes me a little crazy, but that's all right. So the idea here is that you, we bundle up the change scripts and the plan into a directory. The plan file that gets written to that directory is generated from the VCS history. And so then with this in this directory, you can package it up you know, as an RPM or a Debian package or a gem or whatever, however you want to distribute it then you won't need the VCS on the target system. You would just need Skitch on the target system to read the plan and do the deployment. So let's ship it. I'm going to bundle it, and I'm saying tags only here. You know what tags only means is that when I write the plan file, I only want it to use tags in uh, the VCS for the named tags in the plan. I didn't want it to use the individual SHA-1s of every commit. And so what it does here is it first writes a configuration file, copying uh, the configuration that I have and for the local repository. So it knows to deploy for Postgres, for instance, and any other settings I might have in there. And then it creates the, the bundle for the v100-dev1 tag with its now four steps. And what it does with those is it writes them into a plan file in our bundle directory. And if we take a look at that plan file, it's pretty simple. It's you know almost it's very similar to uh, a Git configuration file or in any file. All we have is a bracketed name, uh, space delimited uh, tags, and then the steps that are associated with them. I have just the one tag here with the four steps. The 
individual scripts for these steps, the deploy, the revert, and the test scripts were all copied into directories in this bundle directory as well. So they're all ready there to be packaged up and shipped off. What that might look like, and we can test it here just by going into the bundle directory, is uh, tell it to deploy to a new staging database. And you can see here that it's deploying the v100dev1 tag with its four changes. And of course, the steps, uh, excuse me, the status then shows that we just have the one tag in here. So this is the current state of our database. So now this looks good. This is ready to ship off to QA to do some detailed testing on. Any questions so far? I don't know if that's good or bad. What's the big uh, Well, so QA was doing some testing. And they realized that if two users have the same password, they have the same hash of the password in the database. Which, you know, might seem a little obscure, but the truth is if then, you know, uh, user foo somehow got access to our database, they could easily look up and see who else has the same password and then they would have access to their data. Never mind that they have access to the database already. It's an example, okay? Work with me. So the way to deal with this, I think, is to, uh, instead of using an MD5 hash on the passwords, we're going to encrypt them using PG Crypto. So the first thing we need to do is write a new step to add PG Crypto. So all I'm doing is calling add step with PG Crypto, and then I edit the deploy file to simply install that extension. Simple, right? I'll leave the revert script as an exercise to my audience. Now, the question is, how do we go about modifying the stored procedures, the functions that insert users and change their passwords to switch from MD5 to PG Crypto? Now, typically, what we do is we copy the user, the insert user.sql to a new deploy file, call it v2, make the change to that file, copy it again, the original, to the revert file called v2, but don't make any changes to that one. And now we have three copies. I'm repeating myself, but this really does annoy me. And then you're going to do the same thing for the change pass script. Now, these are pretty minor changes, but the outcome in our VCS is that if we want to say, so what, was, what changed between these two commits? It looks like this. It looks like I've written, ooh, don't smell my water. I've written completely new functions and completely new uh, steps. Like, they're come whole cloth. Now, if I happen to know or notice that they have almost the same name as an earlier one, I can diff those files specifically. But the VCS itself does not know that I've just changed this one thing because I've had to copy the whole bloody file to make the change twice. <coughs> So what I decided to do was to try to use the VCS history for this instead. So think about it this way. If we just modify the scripts, the change scripts, in place, right where they are, without copying them to new files, it might work with a single caveat, a single requirement. And that is that the change must be idempotent. Forgive me if I've mangled that word. What that means is that no matter how often or in what way that this uh, script is run, the outcome must be the same. This happens to work very well for create a replace function. As long as you're not changing the signature of the function, you can make the change in place using create a replace function. And no matter how many times it gets run, the outcome will be the function that you have created to replace create or replace whatever was or wasn't there before. So the nice thing is that then with this requirement satisfied, the idempotence uh, of create or replace function, we can go ahead and make the changes in place. 
So the outcome is that then the change to insert users is a simple two-line change where I have added PGE crypto as a requirement and I've switched to using the crypt function here to set the password. And similarly, in the change pass function, I have a three-line change where I've added PG crypto as a requirement and I've switched to using crypt here. So does this work? Not yet, but the idea is that then we could say, as usual, deploy untracked, and it will deploy these changes, just as they are here. And if we give it a try, using the same password for two users, we see that we now, in fact, have different values stored as the password. So that's great. What if something went wrong? What if we had to go back in time? So let's revert to head. And now they've been, those changes have been removed. And if we run it again, we see that we're back to where we were, where we're getting the same hash value for the password. And the way it's doing this is that instead of reading the file as it is there, it will say to get, um, uh, give me the value at this point in time as of the tag that I have in the plan file for this change. So it can read the complete files, the change files from the git history without us having to duplicate that code in a new commit as brand new files. So that's all well and good if you're using your VCS for, de in, for deployment because then you have the history right there. But what if you then want to bundle it? Well, in this case, what we would do, uh, let's give it a try. I will now tag this as beta 1 and bundle it with tags only. And we can see here that, as before, it bundled the dev1 tag with its four changes. And then it bundled the beta1. Now, it has appended the v2 to these for us. So it's noticed that these are duplicates, but it's reading the versions. For these, it used the version that was at this point in time. And for these, it uses the version from this point in time, read directly from the git history. Then it writes the files out, and you can bundle them up. So they're duplicated in your distribution, but who cares? right? much less of an issue. And if we look, you can see more or less what I hope you would expect for the two tags and their steps in the plan, the distributed plan file. So let's go ahead and deploy those to staging. And you can see that they were added to staging, which had been on the previous tag. So that works. And now we are at the beta 1 tag. Ship it. So uh, that is a very brief introduction to kind of the ideas behind the, the core of Sketch. There are a number of other commands that I have planned and that are in progress. I showed you log before. So log would show a complete history of all the changes you've made to a particular database, uh, regardless of whether they were reverted or not. Uh, there will be a check command that will basically sanity check your plans, your steps, check for duplicates, see if any prerequisites are missing from a particular database, that sort of thing. Uh, a test is something that I plan to do so that for each step you could have a test to uh, regression test it, make sure that the deployment actually worked, the deployment of a particular step actually worked. I'm not sure how that'll work yet. It might be that there are just, uh, it'll just diff output or maybe there'll be some sort of tap integration for Postgres or something. I, I don't. I'm, that's one of the places where I'm arm waiting right now. And there's a help command, not unlike the git help command, and you can use it to say help on all these other commands, and it'll show pretty extensive documentation for many of them. So the current status of the project is I've been working on it full time for about a month. Um, I'm grateful to my employer, iOvation, for saying, yeah, we need this. Go ahead and work on it, and let me work on it at work. Um, I'm also starting to rethink the, the VCS integration because I think that this is, this is nice and it's a decent idea and I really love being able to move backward and forward in time without duplicating files, but almost no one has a Git history that that's, that's that clean. Never mind Subversion or CDS. So I'm starting to rethink whether instead of having kind of a deep integration with the VCS, there might be more of a, a complement there. So 
we would rely more spe specifically on a plan file for which we would uh, have tools to write to it and complement that with the VCS history or have ways to mark particular points in time in the plan file that it could then ask for things from the VCS history. I'm still trying to work that out. But what's become clear to me is that we'll need tools to manage uh, plan files and adding tags and steps to a, the plan file independent of whatever is in your VCS history. So that's stuff I'm just starting to work through now. But I could use your help. Uh, we have a site, skitch.org, which is the a default uh, GitHub site with their new, one of their new designs. It's on GitHub, fork it. Uh, I do want your opinions. I want to know where I'm completely wrongheaded about this, what I have overlooked, what sorts of uh, patterns perhaps it is currently in its current incarnation failing to satisfy, uh, whether that m m makes things change now or gets on some sort of uh, roadmap. Either way, I want to know how we can make this as useful as possible for as many people as possible. Uh, so obviously, I want uh, any code help would be much appreciated. Uh, documentation writers, at some point, it would be nice to have a nice website to sell it. Uh, but I'm asking you for your help to make it great. I will do the best I can by myself, but it would just be me then. And I want this to be something that everybody can use. So I thank you for your attention. We seem to have 18 minutes for comments and questions and insults. Can we get the lights off? No, you can't see me. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I'm as free. Yet. No, I'm sorry. So, uh, one a huge pain point with migrations is uh, when to run them. Yeah. Everything's easy when you have 100 meg. So a migration takes, you know, a second or two. Right. Maybe it's really hot. You can't get that alter table lock. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mostly that's enough. Uh, where things get really hard is like 100 gigs, 500 gigs, whatever. Right. Uh, and doing zero downtime deploys in that environment is like a whole other challenge. Yeah. Um, and right now, the way that people learn to do that is failure. Yeah. Um, and there's really, there are people who have blogged about it, but there's really no support for that. And I think that if you're building a tool like this, it's an amazing opportunity to take a position on how to do that well. Yeah. And a tool like this, I've seen lots of users, like it, in my slides, I showed the like, you know, you put a default on a column and it's like, ha ah, ah. ha. Right. We're well, rewriting that whole table. I hope you didn't, you know, hope you didn't need that for a while. Right. Uh, it'd be great if. Sorry. If you were to check or test or something like that, had the ability to add intelligence around trying to protect people from those extremely destructive things. Yeah. To a certain degree, I think that would involve being able to parse your deploy scripts to see what you're doing. Well, there's explain, uh, but there's no explain for DDL yet. So maybe right. that's actually one of the projects. Yeah. Yeah, that would be kind of cool, for Postgres in particular. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things I am doing is trying to be neutral about what database you're deploying to here as well. So there's code specific to each engine in there, or there will be. Right now it's just Postgres uh, and a little bit of SQLite. So there will certainly be injection points to do stuff like that. Yes, I mean basically all it is is, is tags and scripts. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really care which your scripts are written in. So somebody's already asked me, you know, if at some point the, the, the deploy scripts could be written like in Ruby or Perl or whatever. And, you know, I figure that's something we could certainly add. Maybe it'll look at uh, file name extensions and things like that. Some people would be more comfortable writing migrations using the BBI or something. But um, overall, uh, whatever 
so if somebody's willing to do the work to implement the engine class for a particular target, I'm fine with it. I assume for a lot of those NoSQL systems, there wouldn't be much need because oh, you just. All the same problems. Did I? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you still have data. You still need to make changes. Yeah. You still need tools to do that. Yeah. Like if, you have to run to. Oh, yeah, you can do that anyway. Yeah. So that's what all the difference is that with Postgres, uh, with a NoSQL database, while you run through the table, you can still use it. And with Postgres, while it's rewriting the table, your site is down. Yeah. So. Yeah, don't rewrite your table. <laughs> well, that's all well and good. Yeah. Make a change. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's definitely opportunities for stuff like there, uh, that. I want to get the core working as well as possible um, in the next month or six weeks. But I'd love to see stuff like that grow up and around it. To make, I, you know, I want it to be as useful as possible for people, in part because everything else sucks so hard. Yes. Yeah, Norman. Can you talk a little bit more about your problems with integrating with Git in terms of thinking maybe I'm not going to use Git or a version control system in this integration? Because all of a sudden now you're not only coming up with kind of a scripting language for Git, but now you're saying, well, maybe I'm not going to use Git. And I don't know what I'm going to do in the testing integration thing. So you've got all sorts of complex issues. Yeah, there are a bunch of questions. So where I'm coming from, it's not just Git. I was figuring it'd be whatever VCS that somebody added support for. I was going to do Git and Subversion. Right, I was thinking if you, if, since you're kind of already kind of controlling how people get things in there, couldn't you force, I mean, talk to me a little bit about how Git gets so messed up here that you're, you're well, so one of the things is that when I'm doing a lot of development, I end up changing my deploy scripts a lot, right. especially before a first release, right. because I'm the only guy working on it, and I do whatever I want. That means I have like 30 commits to a single script. Right. That would make a rather painfully long plan. Well, 27 of them are I'm missing 74. Right, yeah. <laughs> I run my tests first, but yeah. <laughs> I guess you're, you're expecting the person who won't know enough to do like a git squash or a git rebase to clean up the history. Or right. In, in the tutorial, I have a whole section on uh, two developers working on branches and how they need to merge stuff in and how it can be a mess unless you rebase before you merge. Right. I mean, if, if one, I would like to be able to use this, and I think that if one is very careful about how they maintain their git history, you can do it this way. Right. But I think most people are not that careful. So like I've been talking to Josh Berkus about the stuff they have at Mozilla and they have, you know, a master repository and all these people have forks and they all have branches and it's just all over the place. So for something like that, it might be more useful to have the plan file and need to make sure merges are clean just as one file, regardless of what the history is. I mean, it's almost, sorry. So I was going to say the trouble with it is once you start getting into like trying to get my history clean and validated, try to do the testing validating. Yeah. It's almost like you're trying to go to like a Hudson Jenkins protocol where like you stick everything on and everything has to check out before you can apply it. You know? Uh, yeah, well, for, forget that's cheap. <laughs> it's right there in the dot .git thing. Right. So, uh, like, I wouldn't want to use it with subversion. <laughs> right. no, but yeah, that, that certainly would be, that would be another issue that, another reason why people may not want to use it. Step already been deployed, and what was the SHA of the script that was deployed? Uh -huh. And that way, if like your coworker already ran the script, it would be like, no, no, that's there. Or if somebody ran a different version of it, it'll say like, whoa, whoa, this, yeah. this step already exists on the server. Is this a new version? Is this a you are screwed? Yeah, it's like, a it's whoa, a good idea to to like, hash it and and store that as as another check, if nothing else. But um, then, if you, like the UUID is. You may be add user step, and I made an add user step, right. and I deployed it to our staging server, and now you deploy it to the staging server. Yeah. And surprise, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's especially with like long running projects, like you make that branch that's called like ACK or like fix it or something. Yeah. It's like your site's down, and you're like, yeah. ah, I gotta fix it. Yeah, the reason why I didn't want to use something arbitrary like a SHA-1 or, or a UUID is because then if I have a whole bunch of steps, 
my deploy directory is full of all these files that I don't know what's in them because their names are meaningless. Well, I think the names are good. I'm just saying I think that adding a UUID which never has collision sets yeah. validation. I mean, you could have you know, a warning like, hey, this is no longer your case. Yeah, but right. It's like if, if you have collision, it gives it a, a guarantee that it didn't articulate whether this is a different version of the same thing yeah. or a new thing that happens to have names, basically. Yeah, yeah, it bears thinking about. Yeah. Uh, is the idea that you created out of the initial database empty and screwed up through these hundred migrations? Or yeah, or, or maybe you just, so kind of what I'm thinking about with the, with the Git integration in particular is it might be a hybrid with a plan file where maybe I have a plan file that takes me up to a certain point in history and then after that I use Git. And my initial thought for that was, you know, I had this in a project years ago where we had 200 Rails migrations. And at a certain point, we, like, dumped the database and threw them all out and just created one that was the dump. So to do something like that with, with something like Sketch, what we do is then say, here's a plan file, and you start at this point with this new single file. So I definitely want to have ways to allow people to simplify things like that at a certain point. It's an onboarding tool, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Sketch import whatever sketch clone. Yeah. Yeah, there are lots of different things that could be done potentially. So we can find that the monolithic deployment is really scary. You want something to raise the monolithic rollback is equally scary. Right. Like really stressful. So we try to get away from that notion of, of this one big deployment and and be like four and six part phases yeah. where we pull something out of the farm, migrate it. So we don't worry so much about a rollback. Mm -hmm. We think about our first phase as a very, very loose backwards and compatible layer. Right. And we expect there to be you know, four somewhat loosely coupled steps that go. So we pull something out of the farm, you know, put a layer on. Um, while it's detached, we can play with it and test and say, OK, this looks good. We're building up our confidence. And um, you know, we'll go to phase two where we'll bring another part out of the main farm. Farm number two, is it bigger? You know, feel good about it. Then you know, you start to come back. You know, start to create farm two as the main farm. And then once all looks good, we have that kind of like finalized step. Uh huh. Which, you know, kind of plays with that um, backward compatibility where you know, it cements it. You know, the, the different stages are baking process, and when our cookies are ready, you know, we serve. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> Do you think you could do something like that with this? No. You don't think like each of those? <laughs> yeah, but if you make each one of those things be its own tag or even its own step. I don't know. In terms of automating this, you know, we're struggling. This is on the .NET side. Uh-huh. Yeah. Maybe if we, if we like really get it down pat. Yeah. And, and have a real clear vision on how it works and how it goes. Right. Yeah. Especially like in Ruby, you have so much, you have so many cool tools. Right. And yeah. Where we have like. I don't write Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, I like I like Ruby. I just don't have much opportunity. Well, part of that is content. If I roll back my database, I deploy my application based on. I don't roll my application back also. Yeah, right. So that one broke. Yeah. So it goes on that context. If you do this, miss your warning. Please roll back the application. Yeah. Password. Right. Yeah. We tag our database bits with our, our branches to get a base on an application. Right. They're very married. Some, yeah, Chris. I guess the thing that's the other side of this that's. Uh, Thinking about tackling is is just looking for differences between databases to identify um, to say okay so where are the differences you know, we we wind up with unclean systems right but over time there's there's stuff that's gotten out of sync yeah and it, it wasn't managed using any kind of change management it was it was completely ad hoc 
Uh, yeah. Uh, all the EPA added some changes. And, uh, oh no, the, uh, we forgot to change some. Uh, it, it, somebody manually modified some uh, permissions and so forth. Yeah, and there's a table named Frank Test. <laughs> <laughs> No. This assumes that you've got an environment that's under human control. Right. And if, if it ever falls out of control, I think you're lost. Yeah, uh, have you looked at Perseus? So this is another kind of SQL change management system. It's on PGXN and SourceForge and a few other places. And what it does is it basically, he's trying to support the entire language of Postgres SQL, which is massive. And he's dumping out specific specification files as YAML. Okay. So you could do a YAML dump of one database and another database and diff them. And you can, I think you can then use, diff those two files and it will generate patch scripts to, to bring them into yeah. alignment. We have databases that store all of this stuff in the catalog. <laughs> I think he's doing it so that you can then have a file that's independent of the database. So that you can then use it for actually planning deployments. So it, it's much more of the database diff idea. Were you to develop in a database and then to write a deployment script, you run this thing and it creates a diff and creates, generates an SQL script for you. Or a YAML file that generates them. Yeah. Uh, I, what I'd like to have is the ability to say, okay, we've got, let's automate this into our build process. So if we know that we say, wait, we've got this little process that builds a whole schema from scratch, mm -hmm. and we've got some, uh, some change management scripts that say, yeah, here's what we think upgrades it. Mm -hmm. Let's validate that that's true. Right. If it's not true, the answer isn't let's fix it. The answer is send it back to Yeah, that's why I want to put the test stuff in, in Sketch. The same, the same thing works in production. Yeah. So we think the schema should look like this. Uh, we think the schema, the schema must look like this in order for your, uh, for our schema right. to work. Yeah. If you don't match, it's not so much here's how to fix it, but it's if you can identify where the kabooms are. Yeah. He's a noisy hard, guy. Uh, it's, a hard, it's a hard problem, especially if you're going to have to do an update the table to do a conversion. Yeah, right. So you're uh, that is the ball you need to enter here. Yeah. Well, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why I want to put the test stuff into Sketch, so that you basically can have production level acceptance tests, where potentially you can say, do this deploy, now run these tests. If they fail, revert, and send it back to your developers. Right. It's almost, one thing that I pulled around with, but I thought it was too complicated, was I had this crazy idea once of like doing the PG dump right before just in the schema, putting it in the Git repository, and then as I do the thing, I'm going, it's got to match the same tag on the table in the case, you know. But yeah. it gets really complicated. Yeah, yeah. Fast. Yeah. Yeah, different databases is hard. Yeah, it's really hard. The other question, David, is. Yeah. How are you going to keep track of, you know, this is all the step in test that's just thrown away again. You know, I, I deployed it, I tested it, I don't want it. Uh, I guess you do branch? Yeah, branch is what I think of. So it, at, at Ivation, we have separate branches for development and staging and for production. So would you do branching and skip branches along with 
Oh, would I do branching in Sketch? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting. I at. don't think so. Uh, I don't know. Uh, All this stuff needs more thought. But yeah. yeah. On a personal question level, why do you want to support all sorts of different databases instead of just being really awesome that you both get? Well, Postgres would be my first target. It would definitely be most awesome to Postgres, but I want it to be a generally useful tool. I don't want to limit it to just one or two communities. I mean, as it is, it'll start out, it'll just be Perl and Postgres users who use it. But I hope that it will leak, leak out because, you know, um, other projects have other things to contribute and they have the same pain. I mean, when I've worked on MySQL stuff before, this is just, it, it, well, it's worse there because DDLs are non-transactional. But, you know, because everybody hates this. And I don't think the, the solution has to be all that different for, for them. That's why. Anybody else? Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.